Hemolysis is the second of the causes of anemia that we're going to talk about. Uh, and a few things to mention. The severity of anemia associated with hemolysis is variable. It can be mild to extremely marked. Uh, these tend to be regenerative, of course, along with blood loss. They can be pre-regenerative. These guys tend to present acutely, and so you may see it before they start regenerating. Uh, a few things we'll talk about is that you can have intravascular or extravascular causes. And let's try that one more time. And these can actually co-occur, co so we'll say and or intravascular. And this does not specify etiology, so you cannot treat knowing if it's intra or extravascular. You just say that there's hemolysis, so that's not tremendously helpful when you have an animal who's very anemic. Um, and then lastly, there's really specific etiologies. Um, however, we're only going to go through the three most common ones. And the three primary etiologies we're going to talk about is oxidative or our oxidative injury, um, infectious agents, primarily red cell infectious agents, and then I always joke the only cause of anemia anyone remembers when they get into practice, and that's immune mediated. So again, extravascular versus intravascular hemolysis doesn't tell you anything about the etiology of the anemia of the hemolysis or how to treat it, but it's important to understand the mechanism. So extravascular hemolysis is essentially the normal breakdown of red cells gone vastly awry. And so uh, here are red cells being phagocytized by splenic macrophages. And there's a lot of them. This can also happen in the liver or lymph nodes, but the spleen is most common. And of course, when this happens, you have a need to process the heme and the globin, and of course, get rid of the waste product, bilirubin. And that's, we'll go to, now to the next slide before we talk about intravascular. And so just like normal breakdown of red cells, here we have too many, and what happens is the bilirubin is released into the blood, but it has to be bound to albumin because it's not water soluble. And this is when we call it unconjugated bilirubin. It's taken up by the liver so it can be conjugated and it then becomes conjugated bilirubin. And the other name for conjugated bilirubin is direct bilirubin and that's how it's measured. And the other name for unconjugated is indirect and how I remember that is Oops, on and in, and then the other two don't really have any sort of um, prefix. And so conjugated pilirubin has to get excreted. This is my universal symbol for a hepatocyte plate, and so it has to get excreted into, or excuse me, a hepatocyte has to get excreted out of the hepatocyte and into the bile canaliculi to get into the biliary tree. And this stage right here, it getting secreted into the biliary system is the rate limiting step. And so what happens is that bilirubin actually backs up and spills out over into the sinusoids. Bilirubin sort of a yellow-orange. So it backs up and spills over to, into the sinusoids of the liver, and then it goes into the blood. And so, of course, you then see hyperbilirubinemia. And in this one, it's conjugated, and that is water-soluble. So it goes into the kidney and is passed through and you see bilirubin urea. I cannot spell, let's try that again. Oh, I can't write. So you see bilirubin in the blood, bilirubin urea. Um, you also see increases in unconjugated bilirubin because of this accelerated erythrocyte destruction. And so you'll see hyperbilirubinemia that usually is both conjugated and unconjugated or direct and indirect. And you'll see bilirubin urea. So the blood work findings for just extravascular is the anemia. You expect it to be regenerative, but it could be pre-regenerative. My handwriting's getting kind of bad. 
Uh, you can see, you expect to see, and what supports it is hyperbilirubinemia. You expect to see bilirubinuria, especially in the dog where they have a low renal threshold and it spills over. Other things is you expect the total protein, this has nothing to do with any of the bilirubin, to be normal because there's no loss. So that's one of the differences from blood loss. And then we'll talk about characteristic red cell changes that you see um, that would support hemolysis. Intravascular hemolysis has the same ending that extravascular hemolysis does, but it has a different sort of beginning and middle part. So within the blood vessels, there are your red cells, yes? And so let's pretend that intravascular hemolysis is occurring, and these red cells are essentially rupturing, and they're turning into what are called ghost cells. And when the ghost cells rupture, they release their hemoglobin, which causes kind of a reddish color um, to the plasma. So ghost cells are the exploded red cells, and that background red is hemoglobinemia, meaning free hemoglobin in the blood. And this is not a good thing because free hemoglobin can be toxic to red cells, especially in cats and people and horses. And so the body deals with this by having a small molecule that ties up this free hemoglobin and it's actually called um, haptoglobin, and we're going to make him green. And so haptoglobin comes around, and it attempts to tie up some free hemoglobin. Um, that is a terrible pretend hemoglobin. Let's try that again. So it attempts to tie up the hemoglobin. Still terrible, too large. I'm trying to make it super lifelike. Um, so it, it ties it up, and eventually this whole thing will be taken up by the liver and processed the same way that extravascular hemolysis is, is processed. So you would still expect hyperbilirubinemia and, and bilirubinuria. Uh, once haptoglobin, so that thing is called haptoglobin, once haptoglobin is saturated, once haptoglobin is saturated, meaning once it has used, it's been used up essentially to bind hemoglobin, that's when you really start to see um, the hemoglobinemia is once haptoglobin is, again, once it's exhausted. We don't measure haptoglobin routinely. And so you see hemoglobinuria, and because the hemoglobin molecule is very small and it passes freely through the kidneys, you'll see hemoglobinuria as well. So um, that means, so this would be red plasma. So the hemoglobinemia that has red plasma, this can cause some changes that are very special in our red cells. And that includes um, a false measurement of our hemoglobin. So our hemoglobin concentration can be falsely increased. I already fixed a few things. So this red plasma, this hemoglobinemia, results in, when the haptoglobin's overwhelmed, results in essentially too much hemoglobin in the blood because it's all released. And that results in an increase in our hemoglobin concentration that's erroneous. And so our hemoglobin concentration will be increased compared to what we normally would think it would be. So normally this times three equals our PCV. But when we have hemoglobinemia, this will be greater, oops, well, excuse me, times 3 will be much greater than PCV, which is abnormal. And also, since MCHC is determined from hemoglobin, that will actually be increased, which we know is erroneous. Hemoglobinuria, how it's identified, is going to be red urine with a positive blood dipstick and no actual red cells on our sediment. So it's not hematuria. There's pigment and it's hemoglobin. So that's the main differences between extra and intravascular hemolysis. And next we'll talk about kind of the first cause of uh, oxidative, or excuse me, the first cause of hemolysis, which is oxidative injury. That's the next video.